I'd like to introduce Sharon today. Sharon, did you want to say who you are and what you do? Yep, hi, um, I'm Dr. Sharon Allen. Um, I have a PhD in psychology. Um, I currently work for the NHS. I work for Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Um, and I've just finished doing an MA in Integrative Counselling and Psychotherapy. I have a PG Cert in Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Um, and I'm just finishing a doctorate in counselling psychology. They're all fancy words for me learning the best way that I can deliver um, interventions to young people. So I'm just learning a lot to make sure that I can adapt to the young person rather than the young person having to adapt to me. Wow, the credentials are amazing. And and do you work with Roehampton University in the United Kingdom? Because you mentioned yes. NHS, that's the National Health Service in, yes. the, in the UK. And you work with Roehampton I University, with, right? Yeah. So um, all of my studies I did with the University of Roehampton. Um, and I was very lucky uh, to do my PhD with Professor Essel, um, who's world renowned. Um, and so I've still got quite close links with the university. Um, and I use a lot of the research uh, to inform my practice um, and to try and inform my colleagues' practice just so that we keep up to date with all the changes so that we can deliver what young people need. And I think we are really lucky to have you on video here uh, in, in this beautiful city, Kuching. Um, we're going to talk about emotional dysregulation. <clears throat> emotional variability is common for everybody. It's, it's about the degree, intensity and how it affects individuals and when it flows from normal emotional variability to emotional dysregulation. Aaron, you're going to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so as you said, we all have very, very variations in our emotions. Um, that's really common. That's normal. Um, the problem is really is when your emotions are kind of telling you what to do um, and that can be what we called emotional dysregulation this isn't just getting a little bit upset these are quite extremes in emotions um, and often it seems to come out of nowhere so someone might be seemingly um, feeling quite you know fairly happy within themselves and then out of nowhere, they seem to get very, very dysregulated. So you would notice it as being quite extreme, quite extreme anger, quite extreme upset. Um, and it would be completely out of context with the situation. Um, so sometimes when people get upset, we kind of reflect afterwards and we say, OK, um, something happened and they responded to it. But usually with emotional dysregulation, even though something may have happened, the response to it is very extreme, if that makes sense. Yes, it absolutely makes sense. And then I see individuals who tell me that their emotions are literally doing this. So they could be happy in one moment and mm. then they feel sad and the emotions are just taking hold of their whole life. Would that be a fair yeah, way yeah. of putting and, it? And, and I think I've heard it um, described as a bit like an emotional roller coaster. Yes. Um, so that's a really good way of visualising these emotions that are kind of, you know, there's a little bit of stability and then there's, you know, quite a peak um, in emotion and it's it's really hard to predict their emotions. And often they feel that there is no signals. Um, part of the work is helping them to notice the signals because we're quite, we, we have a lot of information to take in in the world. And so what happens is things become automatic and emotions can can kind of be like that as well. So it becomes a little bit of a habit how we respond. Yeah. So so there you go. I think you've led me on to the next question. Tell, tell us about the signals and then then leading on to the causes. Of course, with the caveat that I think this topic is just so big it's that massive. we will not yeah. be able to cover everything. Yeah. Yeah. But but it, at least we get the discussion started. So tell us about the red flags, early warning signs. Yeah. So often with young people, um, I work with neurotypical and neurodiverse people, which means uh, people with autism or ADHD as well. Um, and often it's really difficult if we've got used to responding in a certain way to notice the signals. So often what we'll do is we'll draw like a picture of a gingerbread man hmm. um, and we'll start getting people to reflect. When you last had that big emotion, 
did you feel anything in your body? And it's not uncommon at first for them to say no, there was no signals. And that's because they're not aware of the signals. So part of our work is to help them reflect and become aware of the signals. Hmm. And it can be quite powerful when someone's narrative is, I never have signals. And they come back the following week for a session and they're like, oh my gosh, before I got really angry, I really felt it in my throat. Um, and that's the first step in them being able to manage this emotional dysregulation. Hmm. So the optimum is not to use medication wherever possible. Um, I love Roger's quote um, from person-centered therapy. And he says, within us all, there's the ability to heal ourselves. Hmm. Um, and I think we need to hold on to that. And it's about teaching people skills. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's why you're here. Before we move on to, you know, just to talk about some of the skills, Sharon, any, you know, causes just to highlight what yeah. might be the causes. Yeah, it could be um, often uh, young people have very heightened anxiety. Um, it could be low mood. It could be a neurodiversity. Um, so often the way I help young people understand is um, imagine you have a Coke bottle hmm. and you shake that Coke bottle. Seemingly from the outside, it's fine. If you undo the top of that Coke bottle, you have like a little mini explosion. Hmm. So often it's not one feeling, it's a collection of feelings. So usually the causes that people, for whatever reason, are unable to identify their emotions as they occur and they're unable to express them which means that they have no validation. Hmm. We all are human beings. We need validation. We need people to understand that we're within this world and that we have different views, different hmm. feelings and different opinions. Hmm. So often the cause is a build up of this inability to express our emotions or feel that our needs are being met. Hmm. So sometimes we can express them. So someone could be highly kind of emotional and express them but people are unsure what they're expressing and hmm. so are unable to meet their needs hmm. and um what what about uh with there also like trauma can be yes. one of yes. the causes trauma in early days yes uh, or any age isn't yeah. it and that probably causes a mix of yeah. emotions which then is like a pressure cooker as you said like yeah. a coke bottle um, or attachment styles, right? Yeah. Um, attachment styles. Uh, do you want to just quickly mention? Yeah. So when we're born, um, we learn a lot from our main caregiver. Often that's our, our mother or both parents or a carer. Um, and we learn how to regulate our emotions by getting our needs met. So for example, if I'm a baby and I cry, hopefully a parent will come and see what I want. If they don't, or if they respond in a, an inappropriate way, for example, shouting at a baby, then a child learns that actually, if I cry to get my needs met, I don't get the response I need. So they can go one of two ways. They can become very quiet. So there's different attachment styles. Um, so the ideal is securely attached. That means I cry, I get my needs met. I learn to regulate myself because I have a co-regulator with me, which is a parent. Um, if, however, that doesn't go to plan and, um, for example, I have a parent who shouts at me when I cry, um, then I become quite insecure um, and I might avoid um, contact from a caregiver. So there's kind of insecure attachment, which covers a lot of the ways where our needs weren't met, there's a few different ones. And then there's secure attachment where our needs are met. If we don't learn um, how to have our needs met from a young age, obviously that will carry on throughout um, our childhood or adolescent years and into adulthood. Um, and often that can be what we class as attachment trauma, um, which means that actually it is very traumatic if as a child, when we're very vulnerable, our needs aren't met um, mm. and it's understandable then that that would lead to quite extremes in regulation so what we would call emotional dysregulation absolutely you really explained it very well so 
and uh, you know you've explained it even further to me uh, outside this video and i've invited sharon to do another video to follow on from this on attachment styles because i think it is just so important so so that will be the video that follows this one um because i'm really looking forward to to that one too on talking just about attachment styles but for today, um, Sharon, can you give us some top tips on how individuals can start off? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if it is if it is um, really impacting on life, as you and I would say that, please seek help from your friends, family, mm -hmm. from professionals. Um, but but just some simple tips on how individuals can um, look after themselves if mm -hmm. they have emotional dysregulation yeah um so top tips uh sleep is so important um exercise and eating regularly um because our emotions can be influenced by these so i always call it um kind of getting the foundations right before we build the building yes um and then some things that we can do really really easy thing i call it five Hmm. So you can remember it, um, you just look at your hand and it's five things that you can see and try and take your time when you're looking at the things you can see and describe them. Four things that you can touch and as you're doing it, think about the texture, how it feels, is it soft, is it hard? Three things that you can hear um, and you know, just stop, pause and listen. There's lots of sounds that aren't obvious at first two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste and the reason we do that is often when we're dysregulated we're stuck in our own head and by doing something like the five we become grounded and we become in the present once we're in the present it's a lot easier for us to learn to regulate but what i would say is it's a sort of skill often uh, young people i work with say it doesn't work sharon it doesn't work and I'll reflect with them and I'll say, well, when are you using it? When they're really dysregulated. And actually what we need to do, we need to practice it when we're not dysregulated. So first thing in the morning, last thing at night, it needs to become a habit. And the reason that is, is when we have a habit, it kicks in without us thinking about it. So it becomes automatic. Uh -huh. And then it will work when we're really, really dysregulated. That's so That's so true. So getting a structure and routine in, and bringing your thoughts to the present so you know and you you've taught us the technique so so Sharon what would you say should be the exercise for today I think I have an idea of what you're going to say I, because I always give a brief exercise so go on what would be the exercise I think the for five. today so I think absolutely and I was thinking exactly that Sharon's going to say as of today can you practice the five how many times a day each day at least twice a day but depending you know some kids I work with are really dysregulated so we might get them to do it three or four times a day. Um, and I often say, I'm very visual. If you draw around your hand and on a bit of paper and write the five things and put it up on a wall, put it in as many places as you can, you're more likely to do it. And over time, it's a great skill that you can do and people don't even have to know because you can just in your head look around five things, four things. It can help when you're anxious. Mm. Um, it can help people with trauma, past trauma, as well mm -hmm. as attachment mm -hmm. trauma. It's a really, really useful skill. I personally think even if you have none of the above, it's yeah. a good skill yeah. to have. Definitely. Uh, not just for children, but for um, adults as well. Mm -hmm. So I would say let's, let's get started. Uh, we don't need to have emotional dysregulation. Let's get started once or twice a day. Practice the five. Um, and and put some comments in the comments box as to how it's helping you. So thank you, Sharon. This was That's amazing. Okay. And I look forward to our next video on emotional attachments. So please do not miss the video next week on emotional attachments because Sharon uh, is, is excellent in talking about that and explaining how emotional attachments work and impact on our lives. Um, so as ever thank you for watching and if you have learned something useful please subscribe to my channel like it share it tell it tell it to all the people you know